Calling this meeting to order, welcome to the Providence City Council Committee on City Property. Thank you all for taking the time to be here. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Chairman Gonzalez. Present. Vice Chair Anderboy. Here. Councilman Espinal is absent. Councilwoman Graves is absent. Councilwoman Peterson. Here. There are three present and two absent to have a quorum. Great. So, uh, Madam Clerk, we have agreed to item one to the record. Discussion relative to the conditions of city and school properties. So the following people have been invited. Uh, Jonathan Martin, Director of the Department of Public Property. Dr. Javier Montanez, Superintendent of the Providence uh, School Department. Zach Scott, Deputy Superintendent of Operations for PGSD. James Scott, Director of Interim Governmental Affairs and Special Projects for PGSD. Mario Carreño, who I don't believe is with us this evening, uh, Rhode Island Department of Education and a uh, representative from the Economics Construction Company. Thank you so much for joining us. So, uh, Madam Clerk, if we could swear in our members. Absolutely. Please stand and raise your right hands. Do you swear under penalty of perjury that the testimony you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you God? Please state your name and titles for the record. Jonathan Martin, Type. Director of Public Property. Thank you. Joseph DeSanti, Director of Project Management, Downs Construction. Dr. Javier Martin, Superintendent of Operations. Uh, Zach Scott, uh, Deputy Superintendent of Operations. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Madam Clerk. And I understand that there are exhibits that we're entering into the record as, as well. So that, that is correct. There's a motion to enter those records into the okay great so motion made by councillor anderbois seconded by councillor peterson all in favor aye all opposed discussion you guys have it yeah so we can get started we would love for a uh, representative from ppsd or whoever you see fit uh, to just give us an update about the conditions of city and school properties and also just to hear a little bit more about the school construction timeline. So we have the MOA in front of us. Uh, obviously, there were several changes that were made to the MOAs over time. So I think lots of council members are, are eager to hear more about the projects that are happening in their particular wards. But more broadly, we'd love to hear uh, where the projects are, the estimated time for completion on those projects and what we could all look forward to moving forward. Okay, if I may start, uh, Chairman, I want to say thank you for the opportunity for having us as a team come and present. Uh, we will do a presentation of the work that's being done and some of the work that's going to be getting done. And um, as a team, I want to say thank you for the opportunity to be here and I'm to present. Thank you. thank you all for being here as well. Does you want to kick us off there? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Dr. Committee members. So I did prepare a brief presentation uh, about the status of the current projects and the future projects. Uh, maybe that we could give it. Uh, going to the first page on the project updates. I've noted every project that is currently under construction. We should go through each one just very quickly. The Bay Elementary School is project budget, overall project budget, which includes construction and other costs as well, is $22 million and it's scheduled for completion in fall of 2023. That is a renovation project. Frank Spaziano Elementary School is a new construction project. It's $44 million and scheduled for the fall of 2023 as well. George Webb's Elementary School is a small renovation project, it's about 525,000, and it's spring of 2023. Uh, Pleasant View Elementary School is going to be a major renovation. Actually, Pleasant View is going to be the first school that's going to swing into the Narducci Learning Center, and that is going to be scheduled to start in fall of 2020, uh, or be completed, I'm sorry, in fall of 2024. It's going to start uh, the summer of 2023. And that's uh, 18,109,132. And the reason why that's a, an exact number is that project was bid as a general contractor. So we have a very hard lump sum bid on that, that project. Mm -hmm. And the same thing uh, with Classical. Uh, Essex Hopkins, we're doing a little bit of work there as well, about $450,000 worth of work. And that is going to be completed in fall of 23. Nathaniel Green, uh, 
approximately $2 million worth of work. The majority of that work is in the media center and the maker space, scheduled for completion in fall of 2023 or earlier. Classical High School is a multi-phase project, $40 million, um, and that's scheduled to be done in fall of 2025. Hope High School is approximately $13 million. It's the uh, auditorium, performing arts area, cupola, and the lobby. And that's uh, part of it's going to be done in the spring of 23, and the remaining part will be fall of 2023. And then the Narducci Learning Center, which is our swing space, which is scheduled to be done actually in the spring of 2023, with uh, pleasure of you occupying that starting next uh, semester, the 2023 2024 semester. So those are projects under construction, and I do have some photos I'll share with you in a moment. Um, we do have three major projects that are under, and, and all those are under contract as well, just so everyone uh, knows we have a design team and construction team and all those. Then we have our pre-construction projects, which is the Frank Spaziano Middle School, um, and we do have an architect hired there. Uh, we're in the design phase. Uh, the budget on that project overall uh, is $34.5 million, and that is scheduled for completion in spring of 2025. The Harry Kazarian Elementary School is um, uh, has a design team also um, that's under contract that's 55 million, and that is scheduled for completion of summer 2026. We actually think we might be able to to bring that timeline up a little bit. And the Fogart Elementary School, which is out for RFP right now for an architect services design services, that's a 56 million dollar project uh, scheduled for summer of 2026 as well. And all three of those projects we do not have any contracts awarded for the construction phases yet during the early phase. The next slide is just a uh, an overview of some of the work that's happening at Pope High School. Um, the cupola um, is one of the biggest uh, items right now that is under uh, restoration or renovation. Uh, the auditorium actually is in, in really good condition. All of the scaffolding has been taken down and they're now installing the new seating in there as well. Um, so we believe that that'll be ready. Hopefully we could uh, eventually have some of the kids in there before the end of June. So it might be a good place for a graduation ceremony or something like that. Um, and the lobby was done, that was actually fast tracked um, and added to the project as we uh, were working on it. And that project has been done now. It's got kind of some minor work that's still left to be completed once the kids uh, move in June. The next project is Spaziano Elementary School and Middle School. The uh, photo, the rendering you see on the left is the new elementary school, which is under construction. Steel is being erected right now. The map to the right just wanted to give you a general idea of, of what was happening there. So the Spaziano Elementary School is where the old Spaziano annex uh, building was. Uh, the intent right now is the parking lot across the way is going to be turned into green space so the kids will have a nice green area to play. And then where it says Spaziano Middle School is where the existing Spaziano Elementary School is and that is going to be demolished and a new Spaziano Middle School will be built in that place. And there is a parcel on the other side of Laurel Hill that we'd like to utilize and use for more green space uh, for the kids as well. And then I gave you a representation of what we're looking at for the inside of the school. You know, a lot of this 21st century learning, you know, takes the learning outside of the classrooms into the corridors and, and being able to have the kids move around and learn in different environments as well as outside. And that's why it's so important to have the green space as well. And we have the debate pre-K through uh, K-5. Um, that is a major renovation. Um, and I gave you a couple of uh, street views of what the project will look like in the future. And also a, a breakout, uh, we're creating a new um, area in the front uh, that is going to be uh, right on the street. It'll be a community act, act, asset at the end of the day. Um, and it's, it's going to be something that uh, not only the kids will be able to use, but the community will be able to use. And we are incorporating a pre K program here as well, which is kind of what it shows on the, the bottom. And I also wanted to give you a view of what the new classical high school will look like. That's probably one of our most complicated projects because it's an occupied building um, and it's multi-phased. It's going to be happening over, over you know, many uh, years. Um, and we are, you know, the intent is to renovate all of the classrooms. And at the end of the day, we're using the existing media center swing space, internal swing space, uh, 
but the, the, the plan is at the end that the, the school is going to have a new 21st century media center, which is what you see on the right there, to be able to serve the, the high school kids there. Pleasant View Elementary School is another major renovation project um, that has a uh, high population of special needs children. So there's a lot of different uh, things that we're doing in there for program space, as you can see by the top right hand corner, having to place gated doors for some of those children, as well as some different furniture and soft uh, solutions to some of the, um, the needs of the kids there. And all these projects are doing major mechanical, electrical, plumbing, HVAC upgrades as well. For them. The Nathaniel Green uh, Middle School, this is a rendering of what we uh, have the media center look like when we're done. We were actually trying to actually supplement some of that work with the space uh, adjacent to this media center. I think we're going to do some additional improvements there as well, which will increase uh, some program space. And then finally, uh, the other thing that we are um, in the process of doing is that every elementary school, um, there is a uh, 21st Century Media Center uh, MOA that was issued by RIDE and um, accepted by, by the district. And we're going into every elementary school and, and refreshing it, renovating it, um, adding new furniture, um, significant changes across the board at every single elementary school. And right now the goal is to try to touch and complete every single one of them by September of 2023. And the next page, just kind of an example of how we're Treating furniture now, especially in media center and maker spaces, uh, it's not the traditional furniture you would see in either a media center or in a classroom. You're trying to make uh, you know the kids are learning differently, giving them the ability to move things around, and do different kind of programming. Then the next slide is just, um, I guess, uh, an opportunity just to remind everybody that what we're really doing in these schools is really a significant investment into Providence. And right now, in the next 18 months, there's $180 million worth of construction money that's going to be occurring. And in the next two to five years, it'll be $300 million. And what that really translates to is trying to get that money back into Providence. Uh, you know, one of the things that we've been uh, talking about is documenting and being able to report on that moving forward. Uh, we want contractors in Providence to get to work. We want residents to be working on these projects. We want minorities to be working on these projects. And we want Providence Apprentice. Uh, we need young kids to get into the apprenticeship program because they're, we're in dire need of, of being workers. So this is the first report that we put together um, on some of these projects. Um, and moving forward on a monthly basis, we will be reporting this as well and distributing it um, and to the council as well if, if, if they would like. Um, and you can see in some of these, these projects on um, debate, um, you know, they've taken it very seriously and they've hit 44% of the minority hours today, which is fantastic. I mean, those numbers will change as more workers will come on, but I think it's, it's a, you know, it's a fantastic um, thing for them to embrace it and, and understand what we're really trying to do. And then the last slide is just um, talking about next steps, future events. Um, we do have two websites out there. One is at the city site, uh, and then Providence uh, Public Schools also has uh, a website. Uh, they're both here, so if anybody wanted to click on and go into it. Um, one of the things that we're doing too is working hand in hand with PPSD on school standards. Um, and what that does is basically help us keep cost in mind and have some efficiencies by knowing that in every pre-K classroom, K classroom, we're going to be doing carpeted floors, right? Because the kids are on the floor and not putting VCT down. Having the same type of, kind of uh, door handles and everywhere and security and those kind of things. So the more we standardize, the more lights that we know that we're going to be doing these same lights over and over again, it helps us actually vet out the ones that don't work versus the ones that are working well. Um, and, it, and it does build in cost efficiencies as well. Um, so that's something we've been working on and as, a, as a team uh, over the last couple of months, actually. And then lastly, some great celebration opportunities in the, the near future, groundbreaking. Uh, we have a steel topping that will be happening at the Spaziano this uh, spring, uh, the ribbon cutting at Narducci Learning Center, uh, ribbon cutting at Hope uh, High School Auditorium, uh, ribbon cutting for the media centers uh, as we move into 
to the summertime. And then some fall celebrations that we see happening are ribbon cutting at the New Spaziano Elementary School, or ribbon cutting at the Debate Elementary School, and then some, some groundbreakings as well at Kazarian Spaziano Middle School and Pleasant View Elementary School. That concludes my presentation. Thank you so much. I, I just want to start off by applauding uh, your leadership and thank you for all the work that's, that's being done. This is extraordinary to hear about these school construction projects that are in the pipeline and how they're going to positively impact the students in the city of Providence. Uh, I'm, I, I'd like to start off with a question. So, um, can you share a little bit more about the differentiation between uh, the emergency urgent repairs, whether it's HVAC or other emergency repairs that uh, our, our schools are going to experience versus um, repairs that are just more student-centric improvements? I'm happy to start with that. Yeah. Um, so um, I, I guess we, we have a couple of funding sources. We utilize some of this overall bond funding. The other was the revolving fund that was passed through uh, in partnership with the City of Providence and the City Council last year. That allows us to do less individual school projects and more programmatic um, programs across the, the, the district. So a few that I'd highlight that we've done so far. So um, the installation of high efficiency boilers. Um, uh, historically, we've gotten into a habit of, of kind of really addressing those when they were in, you know, breaking down and collapsing. And so now we're doing a more proactive approach. Um, do you recall how many we have installed? No, it's 18. 18. Is it 18? Yeah. 18? Yeah. Uh, so boilers is one, uh, firearms and repairs are another ones that we, um, that's kind of like health and safety uh, investments that we made. Um, some of the more student-centric ones, I think the great one to highlight was uh, the Library and Media Center. So mm -hmm. trying to touch all schools uh, uh, with that enhancement to their uh, media centers. Um, and while not student-centric was one directly we heard from feedback from uh, students and families was bottle filling stations. So moving from, particularly in the pandemic where we moved away from water fountains, we had um, you know, bottles of water moving down to bottle filling stations like I'm going you know, to the airports and things like that. So mm -hmm. to make it more, having better access to water and uh, was partly part of it, but it was based on direct feedback we heard from our constituents. Great, and I, I think there are some other repairs that are being done around security. Do you, do you want to share more about that as well? And I think there's a broad sort of programmatic element to that as, as well. Um, yeah, yes. Yeah. So I'll start, and then uh, Brian LeMay, who's our director of facilities, he's, he's uh, an expert here, can help uh, pitch in. But over time, as a district, we've added security enhancements at our schools in kind of piecemeal. Um, and so we have different camera systems at different schools and not always consistent uh, safety hardware that we provide. So one of the things has been to engage uh, an external vendor who can help us identify what that standard is. Um, but what's exciting about that is it allows us to not only inform construction at uh, and improvements at existing schools, but also as we're building new schools, we are setting the specification that's going to be consistent across the school. So our new team learning center will be one school that has some of these new um, uh, security standards, whether it's hardware, like door, you know, your door equipment, uh, camera systems or, or other than Brian, if you want to add anything. Sure, and uh, I can introduce myself. Brian, uh, Brian LeMay, Director of Facilities with the Department of School Department. Um, so one thing uh, that Zach touched upon is uh, a piecemeal approach that was been historic. When it was broken, then it got looked at, or it didn't get looked at and remained broken. Um, so we're looking at, you know, taking the technology is constantly changing. If you look at, you know, what cell phone technology was 20 years ago, versus what it was five years ago, versus it was one year ago. It's just continuously changing and the district ha has not changed with those times. So a lot of the systems that we're going back to are like you have your VCR and you're looking for a VCR mm -hmm. repairman and there is nobody to go to for this service. Mm -hmm. 20 years ago, maybe there was a few mom and pop shops that you could go to, but there's no longer. So we keep putting this band-aid approach on these security systems and finally to the point where you can't find parts any longer. Mm -hmm. So you have to go and look at full system renovations um, and really bringing the, that technology to the next level. And um, one um, that we're highlighting is on Naduchi Learning Center, uh, which will be the district first swing space, the first uh, re, uh, renovation project that the district will have. That'll be a tangible piece. Um, security was a big concern that we had to make sure that the level of security matched the level of, of building that we're putting inside of there. So instead of having that like basic 
cheese pizza approach that you're putting to it, you know, we need one with toppings on it that we can really go through and say, um, you know, we're covering um, security and we're prioritizing that just like we're prioritizing the buildings, just like we're prioritizing the furniture, keeping that consistent across the board um, and making sure that we elevate that at all the buildings. Great. Um, yeah, no, that sounds great to hear that holistic approach that's being applied to all of our school yeah. buildings, especially in key markets. Yeah. That's a big part of the standards pro uh, process that we've been working on too. It's, um, it's not having individual approaches, it's, it's looking at it as a big picture, mm -hmm. so that this way we can group some of these projects together, which also will save the district money if we can, we can gather them together. If we have um, high schools that had the same camera system that was installed 25 years ago, that we can approach them as a group and say, all right, well, now we can take care of this one and we can take care of this one and get lump sum pricing on, on some of them. We're also looking at secure vestibules in, in some areas. Mm -hmm. Pena Green is one that we're looking at for added security. Um, there's also been some that have been uh, looked at in the district historically that we're looking at, you know, this work has already been done, drawings have already been provided. Can we knock the dust off of these prints and bring them back to life again? Because the legwork's already been done. Yeah. So, um, but a lot of times there wasn't a funding source associated with them. So mm -hmm. now the district has some money, is kind of prioritizing those and making sure that it don't safe inside these buildings. And what's the timeline on this this construction security uh, security has been ongoing so okay. this is this is a continuous process it's it's been going on for at least the last year and um developing this process and our duty will be the first one that'll have the state of the art security and that will be coming online for september and for the other schools that they're all been in developed gilbert stewart is one that was getting uh, done george west is another one that's that's already been received you know new cameras and a new upgrade new wiring um mm -hmm. as well um, so it's been continuous and we have a, um, a third party vendor that's been going around and identifying all these schools going in, meeting with admin staff, finding out where the, the, the problematic locations are inside of the building mm -hmm. and making sure that we can kind of focus efforts on, on there. So we're kind of gathering a lot of information and we're looking at a kind of big picture execution plan, you know, to, to go through the, uh, a lot of the, the spaces. Any others, any questions with regards to security or this school construction in general? I have a general question. Yeah, I don't know what my heads up because you have a mom. Well, so. go ahead. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> my mom questions come in. Okay. <laughs> well, you have kids in the schools. So <laughs> no, or you have kids who go to school. <laughs> Um, well, one, thank you guys so much for being here. I appreciate the presentation and the information. We've seen each other a million times now. So <laughs> it's good to see you again. <laughs> um, I had a few questions. Um, some are more specific than others, and some are higher level. I'm just going to jump in, sure. tell me off if I ask too many. Um, the first is a number of my constituents reached out to me ahead of this meeting to ask um, specifically, like, what mechanisms you have put in place to get input from the community in order to do these repairs? Like, how are you hearing from the community? How are you sharing this information and also receiving feedback in a way that um, the folks who are using the schools can be involved in the decision making? Yeah, so I'm happy to I'm happy to share. I think we've had obviously a number of engagement not directly related to facilities that facilities come up in just because they're so important to our, to our building. So both in the original development of the turnaround action plan, but then in some of the community meetings. I would say more specifically targeted at facilities, we have um, a few mechanisms. So we have the school building committee. Uh, that's a body that helps advise on school construction. Um, it has representatives from uh, the school department, from the city, uh, from the city council, uh, parents, and uh, uh, some of our uh, school principals. Um, Who from the council has been on that committee? So it's uh, the uh, designee has been the council president. Uh, so. Um, you know, the, uh, it wasn't always attendance um, prior, but uh, he, that council member, he, he was a okay. voting member. And now it's council president Miller? Or? Yes. Okay. Right. Um, and certainly others are welcome to join as a public meeting, but those are the, uh, the some of the voting members. So that's where the school, so presentations such as the one we went through today are where we'll uh, share that information. Um, uh, we uh, also have been doing outreach more broadly, whether it's on Zoom or in person, uh, on some of the upcoming construction. So we held uh, six or seven Zoom meetings through November and December. We had two more uh, this past week in February, where we're sharing some of the upcoming work as well as the longer term work that's coming up. So um, those are opportunities uh, in addition to um, uh, our, our school board meetings and other places where we generally talk with, uh, with the public.
a counselor and grow up, but if I may to just add on to that, do you have a list of the meetings that occurred with community members on these projects before uh, these MOAs were, were established or, or after? I mean, just trying to get a sense of when those meetings occurred. With the school building committee? Or uh, not, not with the school building committee, I mean, the, the community more broadly. Yeah, we can get, we can have, um, we can share some of those lists. So, like, I know. You know this better than you. We've had a lot with Spaziano as we've been developing some of that construction and all those schools that are currently under construction. So that's 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 post the MOA approvals, or is that pro proactively before? So that's after the. I think some of those happened after the stage two was uh, approved by the city council and submitted to ride. So we had approval to go forward with. Yeah, in that case, like Kazarian and Bogarty and Spaziano, and then some of the injuries can happen. Um, but um, yeah, okay, so this is this is tied into that because I, I think there there are some concerns about the dramatic uh, shifts that we saw in some of the school construction projects. So if you compare the 2019 MOAs versus the 2021 MOAs and also the 2023 MOAs, there are some discrepancies that I think members of the community are are very much concerned about. Um, so I, I just want to point out a couple of them because I think it would be great for members of the community to, to know what they are and to also just get a sense of what was the rationale behind why those decisions were made. So the first one I, I want to call into question here is... Um, Mr. Chair, can I provide just a little additional context on the feud engagement? Sure. Okay, so as part of the turnaround on Action Plan, the district established a couple of advisory boards, including a district-wide advisory council, which consists of stakeholders from around the city. That meets monthly, and there's also a, a monthly leadership meeting with the leaders of that group. Uh, there's a parent advisory council that meets monthly, and that may have existed before the Turan Action Plan, but I'm not sure if it came as part of it or not. That, that's another one that meets monthly. Uh, the superintendent is establishing a district-wide advisory Council of Students. Uh, I, I got the acronym wrong, but it's a student student advisory council. Uh, we also have community advisory boards. A lot of the schools that have an input on school decisions. So there's a whole like network of community engagement. And as you know, we're going to start attending council people's neighborhood meetings to uh, present out. We went to Councilman Royce's meeting last week. So. Uh, we do have some pretty robust community engagement going on. Great. So it sounds like there there are mechanisms in place to, to engage the community, which is terrific. I think the more community engagement, the, the better. Um, one of the things that I wanted to point out here specifically was, so if you look at the 2019 MOM versus, and I don't know if you have these documents in, in front of you, um, versus the 2021 MOM. So there's the 2019 MOA, you've got the 2021 MOA, and then you've got an updated 2023 MOA. Uh, Carl Loro, which was one of the schools that uh, the, the district had shared with me close, um, was initially slated and approved for 28 plus million dollars in, in the 2019 MOA. When you compare that to the 2021 MOA, that number was dramatically uh, decreased to $409,000. Excuse me, Jim Gonzalez. Can I just get your name for the record, please? I'm sorry, James Scott, Director of Governmental Affairs for Common Schools. Thank oh, you. you know what? I don't even think we scored. We didn't. Name. So, sorry. Scott, if you, you and mine. Mr. Chairman? Sure. As well. <laughs> <laughs> My name is on that as well. So. Yep. Raise your right hand, please. Do you swear on the uh, penalty of perjury that the testimony, testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you got? And please state your name and title for the record, please. James Scott, Director of Intergovernmental Affairs. Brian LeMay, Director of Facilities and Capital Planning. Thank you. Okay. And so from 2021 to 2023, that number stays consistent. So $409,000. I think there were lots of shifts here, and we can point out many of them. Um, another 
just on the flip side. So that's that's a dramatic decrease in the project. And, and this is a school that again was initially slated for twenty eight million dollars, and that funding is no longer there for that school project. The, the, the district decided that it's going to shut that school down. Um, we saw a dramatic increase in Spaziano. Um, so we looked at the 2019 MOA. Uh, Spaziano Annex was slated for 2.9 million in, 20, in 2019. And then in 2021, there was a dramatic increase. So 40, $44 million was the, was the line item for, for Spaziano. So when you, when you talk about the community engagement here, when you made those changes, were there conversations with members of the community with regards to the dramatic shifts in funding for both of those, those projects? Just, just as an example here, we, we can point to many of the, the changes. Um, if you compare the documents, but were members of the community actually involved in the decision making and the reallocation of those funds? So let me, can I, can I share a little bit about how the MOA has evolved over time? Because I think it's worth just understanding why that yeah. changes. So sure. I'd say several reasons for that. The, the first of which is the funding that we have available for school construction has increased and changed dramatically five times over the past, uh, since 2019. Which is great, but it, but each time that happens, it causes you to reprioritize and you have more possibilities of what you could potentially have done than before. So, in 2019, there was a um, the, the original MOA at 278, but only 160 million was for, uh, approved by voters. Mm -hmm. In 2020, there was a vote to increase that by 140 to 300 million. In 2022, the revolving fund was passed. Uh, in concert with the city of Providence and city council to increase it more. We just had another bond come through. So it is a constantly evolving in terms of the amount of funds that are available. Um, so we, that, that causes us to have to reassess how dollars are spent. The next one is strategic. And I think if you look at that original MOA, what you'll note is in most cases, we're talking uh, three to five million, three to six million dollars per school, um, which I know sounds like a significant amount of money. But when you look at the, the needs of each of those schools, um, they are they far surpass you know uh, those repairs. So if you if you think of a school like you mentioned uh, Carl Loro, uh, even though that was twenty five twenty nine million dollars, the needs there just to make it warm, safe, and dry are fifty nine million. So you could invest all that money, and frankly, it would not feel like a fundamentally different learning space for students. So um, moving away from a, an approach where we do small investments at each school. Where we have to then come back because we did the roof, but then we need to do the floors. It, it's just not a good strategic use of funds to to have spread, you know, having money spread thin throughout the district. And so that's generally why you see some significant increases, and then you need to reallocate from other places to support that. Um, and as we're, I mean, tied to that is where you see declining en enrollments. Um, you know, we, we do need fewer buildings, and so there are going to be cases where we are reducing spend and increasing spend in other areas to prioritize uh, that. And I'm sure supply chain issues and cost of labor, yep. inflation, all those are, are very much tied into the construction costs here. Yep. Uh, and then the last one I would say is a financial choice uh, or a financial incentive. So for smaller projects um, that are health and safety, I think the reimbursement is typically 80% or 80 cents on the dollar. When it's student centric, when it has student centric or it's kind of full rehab, it's 91 cents on the dollar. So you're talking about a 10% differential, which allows you to do more work by doing more significant investment. So I think I just wanted to share that because I think when you look at where we're at now, it, it was an evolution of time where we didn't have all the information about where we were to find the start. So the questions on uh, community engagement. Um, we use the school building committee as the one that votes on approvals to change, and that's the form by which we um, you know, make those changes to the MOA. So that's the that, that's an opportunity for people to uh, share that. And as we've um, had new projects come online, we have um, uh, brought those to both the school board meeting, our, our stage two is voted on the city council. I think it's tricky when, when you are reducing investment in, in an MOA about how you engage on that, because there are cases where you might in, uh, reduce it for this round of funding, but in the next round of funding that funding becomes available. So like, for example, uh, Mount Pleasant was a school that in the one of the more pre uh, previous amendments had funds reduced 
because again, that school has a dramatic need and the amount that was allocated for it wouldn't cover it. Um, but it is something we are prioritizing for this most recent round of bond funding, given the, the more significant influx of dollars. So short answer is we have done, done engagement as we've been doing new construction. Um, we use the school building committee as that mechanism for sharing changes in the MOA. Um, and but happy to, I mean, if there's ways we can change, enhance, or improve how we gather feedback. But to hear. Yeah, sure. I, I think just from the taxpayer perspective, we just went out for another $125 million in school bonds. The voters voted for that. Uh, but when you see dramatic increases in certain projects, and you see projects that were pushed off several fiscal years, as a result of the, of the reallocation of these funds, that then becomes a little bit problematic. I, I think, you know, if we're asking voters to go out for an additional $125 million, and there's one school that gets a $40 million increase, and there are 10 schools that then become, not necessarily on the chopping block, but I mean, you're gonna have to use that $125 million to cover theoretically some of the costs that were initially set out in this 2019 MOA, isn't that right? Is that, the, that, math, the math just doesn't, it doesn't work otherwise. Right, that will be some of it, but again, the, the approach of spreading $3 million across all schools will not, like we will, we will never get out of the cycle we've been in, which is um, just years and years of deferred maintenance. And I understand that $3 million is a lot of money and sounds like a lot, but when you have $20 million, $30 million worth of needs, we will have to keep doing this year after year. So the the there are we do have to make some choices in terms of where we are prioritizing and allocating investments mm -hmm. we are using things like the revolving fund to supplement mm -hmm. uh and do some of those projects that aren't the major renovations but allow us to do some continuing work. so so that so that sounds reasonable for some of these projects where we've got cost overruns again inflation there's there's construction costs over time it makes sense if there's a three to five million dollar differential in some of these projects, that totally makes sense. I, I think what I'm trying to get at here also is, how is it that Carl Laura, so that's not that's not a three to five million dollar differential, that's a school that was allocated $28 million that went down to four, 409,000. How did that happen? And who was involved in the process of making that decision? The, the same rings true for Spaziano, which initially it was slated at $2.9 million, and now you've got a $44 million project. I mean, that's not a 3 to $5 million differential. So can you elaborate more on who was involved in the decision making there? Because the council certainly was, wasn't involved. I mean, we were involved in the sense of the approvals, but uh, I mean, there's not a lot of council members that I've talked to that have looked very closely at the, the individual line items here. And post school takeover, or post province public school takeover, there hasn't been a reporting mechanism back to this council. So this is actually the first time. <laughs> sorry, sorry. If you can bear with me here. So, but this is the first time that we're hearing about this. And if this is the first time that we're hearing about this, we we've had access to these documents. I would I would beg to 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 think that there's no way that the community knows about any of this stuff. This is very much in the details. So to, to answer your questions about Spaziano and Laurel, and then I guess the broader the broader point. So Spaziano, like you mentioned, was two or three that the original um, two point nine. Two point nine, right? It, it was that. And what was the annex? Was the annex was two, yeah. The annex was two point nine. So that's where the construction is happening. That was the lowest rated facility in the state. So two point nine million again would not have. That, would not have been used to actually transform what that school is. So to actually do that full scale renovation, that's why you do need to put in that significant, in this case, four, 44 million. Spaziano is a school in a neighborhood that is has a large number of students, is in high demand, oversubscribed, um, and is one where we have a, a private dual language program that many 
uh, families from around the, uh, the city seek to, seek to go to. Loro, on the other hand, uh, there are many wonderful things about Loro and what goes on inside Loro. Uh, the need of that building is over $50 million just to make it warm, safe, and dry. So again, 29 million that was originally earmarked is a lot of money, but it would not even cover half of what it would take to make that school warm, safe, and dry. So that's just around construction and why that was not prioritized. Again, I, I can't speak to what was the original MOA and why money was allocated in that way, but didn't, I mean, it, it, if I had to, <clears throat> You know, be in the shoes of someone at that time when you have 160 million dollars maybe it is a good approach to actually spread it really thin but now that we have more significant money to do major construction spending you know half of what it would take to bring car lord just warm safe and dry does not seem like a wise investment um and that's on the construction side on the on the just school building which is a the, the or the school itself which is separate from the facility is a school that is seen is about at 50 percent utilization so about half the um, school is, is filled com compared to what the full capacity is. 80 or 80 percent of the students at that school are eligible for transportation. They are coming from different parts of the city. Um, so th that's um, you know that that has been that's how some of those decisions have been made. And again, one of the mechanisms, and again, it, we can find ways to enhance it, is the school building committee, which has representatives from city council and other other bodies that we you know we welcome others to attend as well. So this is a data-driven process, which we really appreciate. And obviously, not piecemealing is the ideal scenario. So we can dramatically change our school buildings for for the students and the families of our, of our community. I mean, that's that's the ideal uh, thing to do. Um, do you have that data? Is there data that you can provide the council with regards to? Uh, the the assessment, the initial assessment. So we you, you have data that that you could share yep. that would essentially show that the need for Spaziano and the reallocation was was justified. Yeah. So a couple versus let's say Carl Carl Laura. Yeah. So a couple of data points we have. There was the facilities report in 2017 done by Jacobs. That's I think people have seen. It's been around for a while. Uh, most recently, we had a report done, Downs Construction kind of built on that to um, look at, you know, what has changed facilities-wise since then. So that's on our website at rebuildpbdschools.com. You'll see all the school facilities condition index as it currently stands, um, enrollment data, utilization data. So those are just pieces we use. We also, you know, if there's uh, programmatic decisions, there are, we look at school parent choice and what's, what parents uh, schools are looking at. And while it's not explicitly in, in some of the facilities data, you know, there are, uh, when you look at different facilities, some are right near green space, some are right near recreation centers or other community assets. Some, again, to, to use Carl Loro as an example, have, have no green space uh, nearby. And that's something we consistently hear from our families about where we want to make investments are in schools. Uh, if we have to reduce the number of schools we have, prioritizing those ones that are near green space or near other community assets. And then when we, when we think about the school building committee, who, who are the two council members that were involved in that? Uh, the or one representative is a uh, council member. It's the, the council president. So it's uh, council president Leozzi, now it's council president. But there, there are two designees from the council. I, I don't believe so. Uh, as, as far as I know, there, there are two. OK. So uh, maybe they didn't attend meetings, but uh, do, you, do you recall any of the who? Do you, do you recall the council members that were initially involved in that? So since I've been on the school building committee, it was the council president who was the one council member designated. Was, was there any other council members that attended any of the school building committee meetings? Not that I can recall. Okay. Um, do, do you know the, the members of the, the council members that were a part of the school committee, of the school building committee? The, the, the city council members that were part of the school building committee? Yeah. It was, it's been the council president, both the former and then the okay, but, okay, um, okay. Um, is there a way that you could provide this new council with the the members, yes. the, the full list yeah. of, of members? Um, the reason why I say that is because there there are two members that that are on that committee. Uh, moving forward, I think it's going to be. I think it's it's me yes, and you. Yeah. Uh, so we're we're excited to to play a role in, in the school building committee. Uh, but fairness is is critically important. 
I mean, we have to make sure that these bond dollars that are being spent are being spent fairly across all wards in, in our city. Um, I'm not going to jump to any conclusions here, but I do know that the two members, it, and I, I, I think you could probably, uh, you could probably validate this at some point. At least the two members that I heard were on the committee were Council President Igliosi, which you mentioned, yep. and um, our former Senior Deputy Majority Leader, Narducci. Mm. Um, and, 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 the, and the reason why I just, I think that's interesting is because, it, again, I don't want to jump to any conclusions here, but there seems to be sort of a correlation between the, the massive increases that we saw with some of these projects and also the, the council members that were involved in the school building committees. So if you look at this 2019 MOA, uh, I don't see, could have been under a different name. It, uh, Narducci would have been Windmill. Windmill. Okay. So that's, what was the allocation there? It was 30.5 million. 30.5 million. So that, that didn't change. It's just been the name change to the Narducci Learning Center. Correct. Yeah, I mean, just two things. I, I mean, I will ask my other committee members. I've never been at a school building committee where but council member, former council member Narducci was up, up attending. So I, that, that's one thing. I would also, I know you shared some of the exhibits about um, the MOA. I think the visual of the map shows, I mean, that when you look at some of these major projects, they are they are spread out across the, the city. I mean, it oh, is. Oh, oh, of course. But I mean, the dramatic increase in one project is just, I mean, that, that to me just three to five million dollars. As we're seeing that across the board here. But for some of those major capital innovations, most of them did have significant additions because, again, a lot of the original scope had, aside from a few schools, most of that scope was very, it was less than, in most cases, $10 million. So I would think in yeah, many there, of those there cases. Yeah, there were some that jumped 10 $15 million. Mm -hmm. Classical, Pleasant View, Spaziano. Yeah, so I've, I've got like a, a spreadsheet that sort of compares the, the two. Um, so when, I don't see window on this 2019 MOA. Do you see it? <laughs> so window wasn't on the 2019 MOA. I think. So there's a 30 million dollar increase on the 2021 MOA that was allocated towards window. Do you want to elaborate more on maybe why that may have happened? Um, I'm just looking at the trying to track through the amendments here. Um, I, I guess perhaps when it was originally passed, Windmill was not slated to be in the portfolio. It was added, I believe, in the desire to have swing space. So we had not had swing space as a district, which allows us to a lot of, do, do a lot of these construction projects a lot quicker. So projects like Pleasant View, we would not be able to do at the level we're doing, at the speed we're doing, and at the cost we're doing if we had to keep students in that space. So if it wasn't included in the 2019 MOA, it was added to, to provide the district with uh, swing space to do that construction more. Okay. So we have a couple of examples of like massive increases. Yep, um, no, I'm, I'm, no argument with that. Like I, again, it's financially sound and part of the strategy of trying to do these deeper investments that actually allow us to have, go from 5% of our stu students in likely schools to 50%, uh, which, you know, at the, using the MOA that was originally passed would not will not get us anywhere close. To um, so, council members, any questions about uh, there? So, if we look at this, there are lots of changes. If you look at each of our respective wards, you can see the increases, the decreases. I mean, if folks want to talk about their particular schools and their neighborhoods, or just any questions that, that you have about any of these changes. Yeah, keep going. Yeah. You guys have specific questions. I do, but oh, no, go for it, go for it. I had one to go back for. Um, so my questions are more um, specific to what we do going forward with these major investments. We've seen that this 
detriment of buildings is an ongoing issue statewide. Um, we don't have anything, I, I haven't heard while we're continuing to talk about these improvements and enhancements. Now, I haven't heard anything about how we're going to continue modernizing them and making sure that they are not in the, in the they don't look like what they do now, to the point where we have to close up schools as a result. Um, can somebody, can you speak on what we're going to do for sustainability and long and future future projection of what we're going to do going forward? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a good question. So, so to share a couple of things, um, you know, part of what we're doing now, again, we've had this evolution of more bond funding over time, which is fantastic. We have a better sense of enrollment projections, and we can marry those as we look ahead to figure out where we want to prioritize construction and how to do that in a way where we are, again, not doing that band-aid approach and how we're modernizing. So I, I would say, um, you know, one is we have the 125 million that was passed in November, um, where we'll submit a stage two application, which is maybe more kind of specific projects that will, like we did last February, would come in front of the council. So we'd be, we'd be sharing what those projects were um, prior to, to it being submitted to RIDE. Um, I do fundamentally believe that by doing some of these major constructions, we do, you know, when you, when you walk into uh, a like new school, which again, we'll have three with Narducci, DeBate, and Spaziano at the start of this coming school year, the, the, the kind of ongoing maintenance you need to do is a lot less than if you had done $3 million worth of repairs. So I think in terms of sustainability, just by doing, by the nature of doing these more major renovations, uh, we won't have to come back to many of these schools for a, a longer period of time. My hope is that as we move from 5% of students in like new schools to 50%, people see the results of what that looks like. So it is, you know, we always, we talk about when we bring families to look, look uh, to show a new school, we're going to Pawtucket, we're going to Cranston, and we want people to come to Providence. We want to be able to do that, and we'll be able to do that, frankly, in the next six months. So my hope is that, that it shows what is possible, and then therefore, over time, we, you know, sustain some of this additional bond funding that we would need to get all of our schools to this kind of like new status. Um. Yeah. Oh, 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 I was going to ask, so I have a number of more general questions too, but a specific question about Martin Luther King School, um, which I think has gone down um, in funding, but the question, and was it listed in the PowerPoint under, you had mentioned all, so two questions. One, you had mentioned all the schools were going to have, all the elementary schools were going to have 21st century media center. King is it, is it on here? It, it should be on it. Okay. Yeah. Oh, there it is. Okay, I'm yeah. looking for MLK. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, but the question I have, so I heard from a number of the parents in the PTO there that the number of pre-K classes has gone up kind of like almost like exponentially it came and there aren't enough classrooms with bathrooms and these are kids who are like four <laughs> and they don't have access to that and then to see the like the amount invested of King go down, um, I just I would love to hear a little bit what we're going to do for those pre-K kids, what the future pre-K at MLK is given the space constraints. Yeah. And then also like what um, what caused that to go down? Yeah, just for the public sanitation application too. It's uh, it went down from eight point six million to six point nine. Um, I can share a little, and Brian can help, help jump in. So um, when we look at a lot of our pre K, we have a, a big concentration at uh, Pleasant View on the west side, and then. Uh, MLK has a large number of classrooms out on the east side, so very similar number. Um, they, it's a mix of, I think MLK might have mostly uh, of our classrooms are kind of diff uh, differently abled uh, younger, younger kids, but we also have Rhode Island pre-K classrooms across the state. So um, we had worked to um, do some of the construction as we ad identified that space. Um, we identified a bathroom plan, so there are cases where we work with the state if um, there's not bathrooms in the classroom, you can develop a bathroom plan, but our goal is to make sure there are bathrooms in, the, in those classrooms. So a number of them do. One of the challenges just to get into the weeds of construction was we found that the, the pipe, the, the like the sewage pipe that you need to connect was not of the right size and would need to actually do significant construction and it would have impacted the opening of that classroom for the start of school. So we, we instead implemented the bathroom plan. I think we're going to try to see if, it, if, it, if that construction is possible over the summer to expand bathroom access in high school. Uh, I can speak about this a little bit. So I started in the district in August, so it was right at the start of schools. And so this was uh, a conversation that was in top of mind um, with opening of schools. Um, so yes, it was a bathroom plan. We started doing some investigative work. Um, there was already a plan in place to have students inside of the space. We were trying to trying to 
you know, expedite having the bathrooms done. Um, when the exploratory work happened, it was found to only be a two inch drain line mm -hmm. in that area, which is only sufficient for sink water to pass through. So in order to have toilets inside that location, you get a four inch main, which would be an extensive project, which would involve breaking up the floor and running a main back to the, to the sewer location. And no one, no one knew at that time where the sewer location would be, the extent, the path of travel that it would take to do that. So it was paused for the start of schools. That plan was, was put in place to try and support that. Since then, we're, we've been trying to revisit to try and do a cost benefit analysis on whether it's, you know, uh, feasible to add bathrooms inside of this space or if we can have a plan B, you know, from the district perspective. Yeah. And um, I guess my question for that, which might be for the superintendent, I'm not sure, but is why were the kids moved before we knew whether or not they had bathrooms? Like why why were they already I, I like think, classes opening yeah. and then you find out that you can't I, have bathrooms? I, I think the plan was that this four inch line was was supposed to have been there and it wasn't. So I think that was found out at the at the, at the eleventh hour at the start of school. And not to dig in on bathrooms, but mm -hmm. um what's a bathroom plan? What does that mean? Like there's four yards in a room, where are they going? Yeah, so, so that's some of our instructional spoke, folks could speak to that better, but it is having both a plan with staff either through times of the day or how they kind of travel from their classroom to the bathroom. Um, so so that is something that um, some schools have developed to, to meet their kind of needs that you have for food -based students. If you have one teacher in some space and they have, a, they have to help with travel, go to the restaurant, yeah. you can't leave the rest of the class unattended. Yeah. So that's what the plan is. There's been a lot place. of like subs and things. It's been. Yes. I've, I've talked to them a few times over there. <laughs> <laughs> like a literal mess, yeah. yeah. And it, if I may, yes, yes. so similarly, this is very similar to the MLK uh, case. We've got in 2019, if you look at Einstein Elementary at Broad Street, 4.4 million that was initially allocated or approved through the MLA in 2019. In 2022, that number goes down to 2.9 million. In 2023, that number goes down to 1.7 million. What was the reason and rationale behind? I mean, it's 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 the funding that that's cool. So when you look at 2019 to 2021, that's a 1.5 million dollar difference. What so what what happened there? Well, what was the reason and rationale behind the, the, the decrease actually over time from 4.4 million to 1.7? So I'm happy to start and then others on my team can join in. Um, like I said, so as we as we need to prioritize uh, and, and reallocate spending to do these major capital projects, that means we need to reallocate from other projects, right? From that finite uh, set of approvals in the MOA. Uh, so there has been work done at Broad Street to do work on the roof and other things. Um, but again, it's a school that needs $34 million worth of repairs. Um, and so that uh, original um, five or six million, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't be sufficient to meet that. So we've had to make choices about as we, you know, increase funding to do these larger scale projects. Again, for all the reasons I mentioned, it does mean reallocating from other, uh, um, other schools. Um, and we try to do that in the way looking at which projects are most urgent, uh, which projects we could use additional or other funding for to support. Um, but we have used, like I said, some of the revolving funds to do some of the other projects beyond um, capital projects. I don't know if you can speak to other specific work we've done across the street or things over time. And is there going to be, so you can provide us with concrete data as to why. Something about this just doesn't sit well with me. I'm sorry to just share that directly that way, but it's, you know, how, how does one prioritize Spaziano over Broad Street? Or how does one prioritize Spaziano over Carl Laura? Yeah. So you're, you're, you're saying that there was a, a dramatic increase Bear with me, folks, please. Like, let's be respectful here. We're, we're trying to keep this cordial. Um, and this is this is this is just you know we're 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 here collaboratively. This is all about collaboration. Um, and I'm sorry to ask these very pointed questions, no, no. but I mean I, I think it's important for us to all know the answers. What's the inherent difference, and and is there concrete data that you could 
provided sweat that shows that Spaziano was the school that was in dire repair that needed a $44 million increase, whereas Carl Laura, which was originally slated for $28 million in this 2019 MOA, no longer has those funds. Or the other school that's potentially going to be shuttered here, which is um, Broad Street, saw a, a, a dramatic reduction in their funds over time. Is like is, is there concrete data that you could provide this committee to show there was a, a, a pure reason and rationale behind those changes? So let me use Laura as an example. Again, it's a school that has 50 million, over $50 million worth of needs that the amount allocated wouldn't suffice. So the options were to add more or, or reduce funds, right? In a school that is- Is, is that is, the same for, is that, is that gonna be the same for, for Spaziano, for example? For yeah, so, 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 so let me get to the next point, which is Loro is half underutilized, is the lowest chosen school in the district by parents. Low, lowest, lowest chosen school in the district. Spaziano, uh, at capacity, a large number of uh, parents choosing it. So that was one data point about why we decided to, early on to invest in Spaziano, again, the school that was the lowest rated at that time in 2017 in terms of build, building quality in the state. So it'd be, it'd be wrong to say there's one data point we look at and that's how we make all these decisions, right? We wanna look at building quality, you know, choice, utilization, uh, funding available. Like we, we need to take all those into account so we can talk to, like I shared with Rod and Laura, both had significant building needs that were not met through the MOA, both mm -hmm. saw significant enrollment declines. Um, Loro lacks uh, green space. Broad Street has a very small amount of green space. So a number of reasons uh, that are factored in. So we can, you know, happy to talk through. We can go back and look through as we made those amendments because again they were made at different points in time um, about what the reductions were. But it would be wrong to say like we only look at one thing and that's how we make decisions because a lot of these have to you have to use all those different factors. Well, yeah, so. I, I think we would just be curious to see what that specific data is. Having some real reason and rationale behind it because I, I can assure you it certainly wasn't the community. Um, if you, you, you talk about all these different uh, groups that we're, re we're meeting with monthly, but I don't think there's a single member of any of these communities that wants their school shuttered. Yes. Yeah. I, I, so I, I, you know, as, as a parent who you have to send their kids to their local school to hear that their school's being shuttered and to also hear simultaneously that there are certain schools in certain neighborhoods that are being reprioritized over others. Mm -hmm. yes. That we got to do something about that. Thank yes. you. Yes. Can I, can I we have 3,000 less students than we had three or four years ago, and we continue to lose another 3,000. So I understand it is not to minimize the. Um, the, the concerns or challenges with closing schools, but it is it is also not a viable solution to keep all of our schools open uh, in the same number of schools that we have in our portfolio. Mm -hmm. Not only do we have not you know not a not as many students as we had, we have again six thousand students is a thirty percent decline. Right, like that is it would not be wise for anybody to continue investing piecemeal in all those schools to, just to keep them online. And I, and I get that means that there's going to be some schools that receive funding and others that don't. The data that's used is building quality, enrollment, parent choice, and so there. Are, it is. It is by no means an easy decision, um, but one I think ha that has rationale. Um, it, it, is it possible to also provide us with the data on staffing? Because if if staffing, let's say theoretically, in one of these schools decreases over time, then it would make sense that enrollment rates also increase over time because it, you know you've got to keep your your student to teacher ratios in a in a good good place so do you know if the staffing levels at these schools has been consistent over time or has there been changes in in the staffing levels at any of these schools yeah i mean as we see enrollment declines we also see you know staff declines so a school that might have at one time i think carl Loro might have had four or five First grades, second grades, and third grades. Like there, are, there are not that many uh, first grades, second grades, or third grades now. Again, because we just have fewer students coming into the district. So each year, it's not that when we 
Um, when our enrollment declines, it's, it's not as often like a second grader not showing up next year as a third grader. It's just fewer kindergartners, fewer sixth graders, fewer ninth graders at the typical point where you bring in new students. So less students enroll, that means, you know, over time that leads to fewer staff uh, at that school. Uh, and for the additional $125 million school bonds uh, that'll be allocated in the future, are you looking at the enrollment rates in terms of where you're going to allocate and invest those, those dollars, I'm assuming? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> in the early, early phases of that, I think the one project that seems most clear is Mount Pleasant, just because that is such a, of our high schools, it's the one it has the highest level of need, um, more than all of our other high schools combined. Um, but for the other projects that is that we've used that that funding for, um, we want to look at en enrollment trends and where um, we want to prioritize investment, both both based on where students are live and choose to attend. So that that's going to be included in the additional one hundred twenty five million dollars in school bonds. Yes. Okay. It's, again, it's just fascinating that initially it was, it was slated to receive. Quite, you know, I think in 2019, this was a concern that was brought by many members of this community as well. In 2019, it was um, 29 million. Yeah. In 2021, it got dramatically reduced to, to 3 million. Wow. And, and then in 2023, it's it's at three million three point six, so we're we're pushing that project off several fiscal years, and we're using the one hundred twenty five million dollars in school bonds that the taxpayer just approved because of the reallocation of the of of the funds in the initial MOA. I would keep, I'm trying to make sure I understand that question. Well, it's, it's, it's not really a question. It's just when we look at, when you look at 2019, there's $23 million that was allocated towards uh, Mount Pleasant. Mm -hmm. And that dollar figure was dramatically reduced <coughs> to 3.6. And we, we just went out for $125 million in, in additional bonds. So what we're saying here is, you know, this this project could have theoretically been the pipeline to be done with some of these other projects, but because of the dramatic increases that certain schools experience, now this project has been pushed off several fiscal years. Which would you agree with that? I'd say it slightly differently, which is Mount Pleasant in 2017 had 40. $4 million in deficiencies and now over $150 million. So in the original allocation, however much was allocated, wouldn't be enough again at that time if the charter had started that day to make it warm, safe, and dry. So when the most recent round of bond funding came up before this $125 million, you know, there was not, we couldn't do other projects and it was a trade-off between Mount Pleasant and others. I think with this new bond funding, there is an opportunity to do significant work at Mount Pleasant uh, in part because there's I think, yeah, you can correct me, there's additional, you know, there's, there's more approval for funding in there, um, in addition to that 125 that allows it to, uh, to do more work at Mount Pleasant than we thought. Okay, so you're saying that, that that particular line item might be well over $29 million? For Mount Pleasant? Yeah. For, when we look at the, yeah. I would assume so, yes. Okay, yes, absolutely. Um, so, with regards to enrollment, I think we can all sit and listen and compare notes on how important enrollment is, but the reality is, is that enrollment is going to continue going down. We have, not only are we competing with private schools, but we consistently compete with charter schools. Mm -hmm. um, that's needed to say one point or another with regards to any, it's just a common fact. Um, one of the things that we need to continuously keep in mind is that, um, while I understand that there are greater needs. I understand, Chairman, what you're trying to say in terms of when we allocate these funds and the shifts are being made, it should be made in the most fairest way possible according to all the wards in, this, in the area. Um, while I, and I do understand where you see it's fiscally responsible to do one versus another. Um, my question is more towards displacement 
um, and actually the capacities that we're looking at going forward. So for example, um, you have stated that Spaziano is at capacity. We're about to build a whole, looks like a whole new school. And right now it's already at capacity. My first question is, what is going to happen to the students from Laurel? Where, where will they go? Where, where is the shift? How, where, how are they getting there? If you could give me a little bit of background for the record. Sure. Um, so Laurel, um, a few things I'd share. They have some specialized programming at that school. They have a behavior program, uh, which supports some of our highest needs special education yeah. students at the elementary level. Um, we thought that it was important for that um, group of students to uh, stay together and stay with the staff members who had supported them. So that program is relocating to West Elementary. Um, uh, that it's five classrooms of students uh, and the faculty that have supported them at Laurel will, will go with them to um, West. It's a school that also has the current principals of former special education director in the district and so um, felt like a, an appropriate place um, to have those students. There's also a dual language Spanish uh, uh, program where, uh, sorry, a dual language program and the, the dual language Spanish portion of that program have seats um, allocated at Young Woods. Um, though they're able to choose other other uh, um, dual language programs in this in the city, and some some have chosen that, some have um, chosen um, to move into non dual language programming. So, um, in terms of the process of of, of having um, students re reassigned for next year, so uh, we had a process where we met with families, they shared um, preferences for the following school year. Um, those were uh, we received those in earlier in February and we had about close to 99% of uh, families had submitted preferences for next year. We're now going through the process of looking at preferences, making sure siblings are staying together um, and doing those reassignments. So Boro, just to talk about it specifically, 84% um, of those students are, are bus, you know, receive transportation. So many, it is not, it's a school that does not have a number of students coming from that nearby neighborhood. So many are choosing to go uh, to schools um, uh, closer to home. Some are, are choosing other schools that you know may not be closer to home, but they have those options when they're in the places. So when we're talking about um, these schools and as the, you know, we're shifting the populations in them, um, my concern is student-teacher ratio. Mm -hmm. Less schools means larger classrooms, means harder harder times to have. We all read the Hopkins report all those years ago that talked about how terrible the student-teacher ratio was and how difficult it was to actually be a student learner, to, to, to learn. Um, I work in an educational capacity, so I see how beneficial it is to have a small student to teacher ratio. And my concern is, is that we, as we continue to continue building out what this is going to look like and we continue to close the schools down, while enrollment is one thing and there is a lack of, we're continuing to expand on these classrooms. So instead of it being 20, 24, we're going to go back to this 30, 35. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that, when you're talking about learning services or um, being able to find um, proper behavioral education and, and spe spe specialization for students, those are all inherent in their ability to learn and to thrive. Yeah. So can you explain a little bit about how we're going to or what these are potentially going to look like and what we're going to do to offset some of that um, potential problem that could be coming forward? Sure. Um, so to, to share a couple of data points, we our max class size in the district is 20, 26. Um, our average class size at the elementary level right now is um, 21 and a half. Um, there's obviously wide very you know some wide variations some are smaller than that some are larger um when we projected next year based on the school closures um that number changes from 21 and a half to 22 and a half on average so it is an increase but it is not to the certainly not to 30 because that's that would be above the maximum um but at, we've had declines over the past you know again 3,000 students over the past several years most of them at the elementary level those class sizes have declined pretty significantly and not that anyone's looking to have ever be at that maximum, but we are significantly, you know, we're below now and we, we're projecting to be below next year based on, um, based on our enrollment. As we consolidate schools, do you have any concern that the shuttering of these schools would actually result in uh, a decrease in enrollment? 
um, and, and also the expansion of, of charter schools? Yeah, I mean, it's hard to speak. To, when, yeah, charter schools certainly do have an impact on our enrollment. My hope is with doing you know, new construction that that actually brings students back into the district in ways. So when we're actually sitting down with lower parents mm -hmm. and at one of the community meetings asking about uh, school options that, you know, people are excited to look at uh, <laughs> some of the schools like debate, like Spaziano that we're actually going to be brand new next year. So my hope is, again, shuttering schools, there are certainly impacts to doing that. I, I, the hope is that building new schools also attracts people back to the district in ways that we hadn't before. Okay. Sure. Thank you. I kind of like less intense uh, questions. One is, what happens to the schools after they close? Like, what happens to those buildings? They're, they're property of the city of Providence. Yeah. yeah. So we don't, you know, we won't occupy it. Um, so it'd be up to the city of Providence. Okay. To, okay. And then the other is, what will the so the swing space at Narducci is being used to like be swing as all this construction is happening? What's the long term plan for that swing space? Because it's like thirty million dollars, right? Like, yeah. Like what are, what are you, what so are? sorry to interrupt. Uh, oh, no, so please. no, we're excited. I mean, it, it it will be like new. It'll be for Pleasant View the following year, and it might be for one of the future construction projects the year after. After that, it will absent additional construction going on, it would likely become the new home for another school. So we would have time to plan, you know, starting now about whether that you know, very likely could be an existing school that, you know, is a poor facilities quality could actually relocate to, to a brand new beverage. Now that is three to four years out and we need, we have lots of time to, to plan for that, but it would the ultimate, to, the short answer to your question is, it would ultimately become the home for like a, a, one of our current common schools or some combination of so would it entail like closing another elementary school to move into Marucci, like when the swing space time is over? Is that what's in the horizon? To be, I mean, we, 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 that's what we have to, frankly, have to engage with community on the, in the coming years. Now, when we say it wouldn't be closure necessarily, it might be a school that is physically relocated, but that that whole school will move together. It could be, depending on enrollment, it could be two schools moving together. Um, but again, that's not. Yeah, that's several years out, I and mean, yes, that's the engagement to be done in the, in the coming years as we get clarity on when it finally becomes open, kind of open and not being used for swing space, uh, and what you know what communities nearby or elsewhere in the city could better utilize that space. Yeah, but just I'm oh, sorry, yeah, one please. last thing, because oh. because you know there's part of how you improve overall facilities quality is doing this construction. But if you have a, a school that's in a poor facility moves into a brand new facility like Narducci, it is by taking that other building offline. It is. It's not just doing new construction, it's doing away with, you know, like not having to invest in areas that you may have had to invest before. Yeah. I guess my question was a little bit also like if we were planning a $30 million building, um, the Windmill Elementary School or not our UG, like that $30 million would have been the shortfall for Laura. Like, and so instead of creating a whole new building, we don't have a long term plan for it, sounds like. Like we have existing buildings, and it just feels like we're creating stranded assets of like these are going to be empty buildings that now they're just on the city's rolls. Like that's my concern. Like if we're going to put thirty million dollars in something, we should have a thirty fifty to plan for. It. Like not just this, like the next four years of swing space. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Um. So I'm going to bring. <laughs> 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 I'm going to Um. So I'd like to um, go back to Mount Pleasant High School because there was a lot, um, and Mount Pleasant is not necessarily in my ward, but it's next to my ward. Um, and I had um, quite a bit of dialogue with constituents over the weekend about their concern about um, A, the school clothing, um, B, the school um, perhaps not closing, but maybe we need to figure out what's going to happen to it, which might mean that it's going to be a smaller school and what that looks like, right? So um, I am not one to engage in hearsay, um, but it is very alarming when you have your constituents call you and say, what is happening? Um, and when you can't provide answers, um, it's very difficult to be able to continue on a conversation um, and it's, it creates the continued lack of trust. And that's a problem that I very much yeah. um, would like to prevent at all times. Yeah, um, I was able to attend a community meeting yesterday that was held by um, some state, uh, our local state reps and senator. And I went um, to listen. 
uh, because I think that an informed elected official is the, is the best one that you can have. Um, but really, I want I wanted to gauge what was, what was the constant dialogue and what was also the, the feedback. And um, the feedback was around continued engagement. Um, families, uh, teachers, um, parents, um, neighbors, um, the whole, their whole narrative on this is to make sure that they're constantly being informed. And I appreciate knowing all of these different forms of engagement that we've done. Um, I do feel strongly though, that I don't think it's getting to them in the best possible ways. So, um, I would love to be able to be a part of whatever distribution that you're sending out for um, continued engagement on this because I need, I would like to send it out to my constituents so that they're aware because I think if we're having these committees and we're having these councils and we're all convening and having conversation, it's extremely important that the community continues to be engaged. This is a very, very, very important topic and um, for the future, not only of our students, but for the, for the neighbors and how we continue to build what Providence sure. is going to look like. This is this is of, of the utmost importance. The other piece that was um, resounding in this particular meeting was um, the, the discussion around what Mount Pleasant would look like. So I would like to ask on record, what is the potential of what's going to happen for Mount Pleasant? Um, what are we looking at? If this distribution of money is not there, what's it going to look like in three or four years? Are we going to build a smaller school? Are we just going to renovate? Um, I'm under, and I believe very strongly that with all of the work that's been done on the green space in at Mount Pleasant, it is absolutely, it would be crazy to think that we're not going to continue to have a high school in that area for those students. So um, there's a lot of investment that's been made over there and I would like to make sure that we continue to see that high school thrive. So please, can you tell us what this plan looks like so that we're able to inform our communities? Absolutely. So um, yeah, it is unfortunate that that information was shared. We tried to correct the record a number of times with individuals who seem to be sharing that. And I think the superintendent shared something with the council member, just to, to be very clear and on the record, unequivocally, Mount Pleasant is not closing. Um, and has not been, that has not been a consideration. I would say where we're at, and you can correct me on how this kind of normally works, there's a stage one application that went into RIDE that just says we have a need for construction in the district, which is very open um, because we don't know yet what that what the what the plan for construction is. And that's not that's just being honest. Like there are options to not not even like i they're they're not renderings, but you can imagine anytime you do school school construction is you can renovate, you can knock it down, rebuild on the same site, you can rebuild nearby. Those, what we have to do now as part of stage one before we get to stage two is understand what are the options, what what's the cost, how long would it take? Because each one of those, a renovation cost is different and has a different timeline than if you're doing rebuilding. So it is, I will just say it's like not, it is, it is not determined, um, but that's the process from stage one to stage two, the stage two application, even with construction being frankly three or four years out. Um, but we also have committed, we're going to the, uh, there's a community meeting in early, March, I think, to share <laughs> that same information. A lot of that engagement, as we prepare for phase two, ha will happen later in the spring, but given that information had been shared out, I think there's a uh, ward meeting in March, March 6th. Uh, March 6th, uh, Councilman Ryan's had a meeting at the public library. So we'll be there to share more information, but where we're at is the honest answer is we've identified it as a need, need to figure out what the options are and then vet those options because sometimes until you actually do more of that due diligence, you don't know what the options are or that there's either something really advantageous or unadvantageous about different paths to construction. Right. Yeah, and, and to that end, I know, you know, we don't report to the council on this stuff, but the, this, the MOAs have changed over time and the dramatic difference that we see is in 2019, we had the school board uh, actually sign off on this stuff. Uh, post school takeover 2021 2023 when you look at those moas it looks like those decisions were made unilaterally without the school board so and, and i know we're not the the oversight body anymore with the, with the state takeover but what we would like ideally 
is to have consistent communication and dialogue. Mm -hmm. And if there are any changes that are proposed in the future, we're aware of those changes so that way we can let the community members uh, in, in our respective communities know because the lack of transparency around these changes, yeah. quite frankly, is, is, is alarming and, and, and problematic. I, I, I know that's pretty direct, but we can't, I think it, it's just not right for people to, to hear about this stuff yeah. in the darkness of, of night or in the 11th hour when you know the cooks are in the kitchen cook, cooking all this stuff up and and you know we're we're the only reason why i think we're here today is because we really wanted to to set the table and say moving forward let's work together collaboratively we have to work together and um we ideally would, would like to be a part of that process so i don't know if, if it's possible for you all to come back periodically to share where we are on these school construction projects to provide updates but uh we we love that commitment uh from ppsd if that's a possibility yeah we can do that absolutely thank you um that's a pretty different sure question. um so kind of different question um there's a really great group called Climate Jobs Rhode Island, which is focused on, it's a partnership between the environmental community and the state and organized labor, particularly the building trades. Um, and they have a goal um, to see uh, all school construction be net zero by 2030. Um, so net zero energy, sorry. I, just, um, I also serve in my other life as um, a member of the, Ener the state's Energy Efficiency Council. Um, and would love to hear like what your plans are both for working with, with like labor and unions if that's a requirement and also like what your plans are for how you maximize like energy efficiency opportunities for renewable energy getting off fossil gas which will be a state requirement by 2050 so just like as we're thinking about these things what how how are these uh what I, in? I can take that um so all of our buildings right now that we're building are carbon neutral our goal is car is net zero um, the only caveat to that, to be truly net zero, we have to have solar, which we can't, we haven't been able to do yet. Oh, wow. um, well, there's there's a little discrepancy in the federal law that if, if we do solar, which is a non-taxable, you use a municipal bond, there's a discrepancy in the funding there. So it actually usually sometimes excludes part of the renovation or new construction having any solar in there. So it's something that can be done after the fact. But right now we're, we're having our buildings get ready for that. Um, we are doing net zero ready buildings right now is what it's called. And that is the goal across the board on all of our projects. That's great. That's, yeah. And are you using union labor on all the projects? All of the projects are using union labor, yeah. Awesome, that's great. Yeah, to that's the best great. of our knowledge. Yeah. The majority, maybe some of the smaller ones not, but with the, the larger projects are, yes. Great. For the sake of time, I don't want to keep everybody here till midnight. Uh, I know you had a, a question. And we'll, uh, Thank you, Chairman. I just have a couple um, quick questions. The first one is just uh, confirming the renovation at George J. West. Is that the nursing center? That's what it is, right? That's the, the nursing area, yes. Okay. Um, and then my second question. Um, so I know regarding Mount Pleasant High School, it was reported in 2017 and needed around $40 million. How did it deteriorate so much in a couple of years that needs 150 million now? So I, I actually do you mind if I start? Please, yeah. So I, I I think that one of the things that would be beneficial to everybody is to go back and look at how that 2019 MOA was actually developed. Um, so this it predates all of us probably in this room right now. It predated us. Um, and there was an all-in conference which had community engagement in it. And there was a rationale and a goal of what they wanted to do with the schools at that time. And in some cases, that's why you saw the two or three million, which was just make the, the roof stop leaking, just paint this. So there was a very small amount of money put there. And as you know, we've changed that philosophy. We want to be impactful. We want to do major renovations. We want to change uh, educational programming in the schools. So that and the 2017 Jacobs report were used as a basis. So I think that we can go back and, and analyze that and tell you how what that rationale was at the time, because there is some information there, and that might be helpful to say, all right, this is how you know the, the, the chairman's work, how the table was set then, um, and how it is now. I can tell you now on the Kazarian project, the Spazian Middle School, and the Fogarty project, we have community engagement as part of our project. 
process. We just had a stage two meeting with, for the next projects, the 125 million going forward. I have six community meetings planned over the next six months. We know how important communication is and community engagement is. And actually it's part of the process. It's part of the ride process and part of the reimbursement process. We need to be out there engaging the community and telling them what's happening on these projects. It's part of that vetting process, part of that discussion. Um, so I know we can't fix what happened before, especially with communication, but moving forward, I can tell you with this, with the three projects we're pre-construction we're moving forward and even moving forward now, we are engaged in that. But I, I think it would be beneficial for all of us to go back and review that all in report and the Jacobs report, and that'll give you a better sense of what the rationale was, how they came up with those numbers. And that's I all just, uh, yeah, sorry, I was just going to, to one of the, what I heard some of the oh. question be is, how the building deficiencies were significant before. Yeah. You know, I know some of it's inflation and that, but are there other so, things like So that? inflation is a, a big factor with some of these, these projects, right? So the bigger the number, the more inflation, the bigger the impact is. But I can tell you in the Mount Pleasant School, which I've been to a number of times, the building is literally deteriorating in itself. So sometimes there's water leaks there, they go up to try to fix the roof, it's not the roof. Oh, maybe it's the window, it's not the window. What it is, is the brick, right? The inside of the, the outside of the building is literally deteriorating. Buildings are 75, 100 years old, so they're, they've they've you know come to the to, to the point where their their useful life is you know they're doing everything they can to keep everybody warm, safe, and dry. But there's a point where it just it, the building starts deteriorating from the inside out, and that's what's happening with Mount Pleasant is it's it's deteriorating to the point where you can't keep up with maintaining it. Um, you know the windows, the, the heating system, everything else that there. And, and now in 2017 dollars, because the 2019 was based on probably 2017 dollars. It's always backed by two years, unfortunately. You escalate those costs now, and we saw over the last couple of years 20% escalation in some years, right? So if, even if you average that out at 10% a year, and you take 50 million and escalate that for a couple of years, four or five years, you know, you got a significant increase right there. Plus, the building continues to deteriorate. You find more stuff that needs to be done. Um, and that's what it is. It's, I think uh, Dak said it before, is we're chasing, trying to always fix things, and that just doesn't work. Is it possible moving forward, just hearing about that is just, thank you for, for sharing all of that. Is, is it possible to work collaboratively with, with maybe the council and community members to develop a, a protocol moving forward? Legally, you're not required, as you know, to, to do all of this community engagement. It's, it's, it's something that all of us just think is critically important, but we set sort of the stage for what that might look like moving forward. So there is a clear mechanism for transparency. And it's not just like we're going here, we're going there, we talked to these people, we did this, but there's a kind of a, a standardized way that we're going to do community engagement. So nothing falls through the cracks. And, yeah, and I, I think the community should tell us what that looks like. Because if we're gonna have all these meetings that you know, PPSD or in ride buildings or even here in at the at City Hall, that's not necessarily meeting the community where they are. We, we need to be out in the community talking to people in their school communities, not in these fancy buildings, um, you know, downtown, right? That's, that's not really community engagement. We've got to push in. We've got to hear from members of our community about what their priorities are instead of you know, us doing this. Understood. Just my last question um, is because it seems like the, the school building committee is at the center of a lot of these decision making processes. Um, does that committee meet on a, on a regular basis every month, like a certain, the same day? Monthly, what is it, the third, yeah. third Tuesday? Third Tuesday, yeah. I can send you the invite. Thank you. All right, and uh, I just, just one quick question uh, before I uh, kick because uh, uh, Councillor Graves will kill me if I don't ask this question. She wanted to know a little bit more about Father Lennon Park. Um, is there any intention of building, building, is. building on that park at all? Or? I could take that, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so that's a perfect example of, of communicating with the community. One of the thoughts initially with Kazarian was to build leave the current school and build 
at the park next door. We talked to the community and they're like, no, 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 we use that too much. So we quickly shifted and now we're gonna vacate Kazarian and build a new building right where in the same space where it is. Yeah. Yeah. But back to a great community discussion. There's a pool there, there's a community center. It's all it's all tied in together that we want to make sure that when the school is constructed that it all works as one uh, community asset. Great. So we're not touching the park. Yes. <laughs> she was very short answer. She was very concerned about that. So well great. We want to thank you for all that you do on behalf of the students and families of our community. And thank you now for taking the time to be here. And thank you for all that you do. Really appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. And then um, we're, we're gonna no, we're, we're not adjourning. We're just we're opening it up to, to, to public comment. Oh, anybody's welcome to stay. Um, I know that superintendent. I know that. Oh my gosh! Thank you for being here. I know you were you were proud of me. Thank you. All right. So for. Uh, just uh, for the general public, well, uh, just for the sake of, of time, just so everyone's aware, uh, the public comment is going to be uh, limited to about two minutes for each person. Um, and um, Madam Clerk, would you like folks to sign up? Or, uh, we... They can just take their names before they speak, and then we can take their names down. Okay, yeah um all right well it's really it's really unfortunate that they decided not to stay um, but um, we we can't necessarily compel them to but i i would say that we're we're here to listen and we're you know we intend to continue to be the community's voice so um with that without further ado i think we can have our first person come up and um love to hear your your, your uh, thoughts I, I mean i'm not going to take one thought i just have one question that I asked. So, um, well it, it is public comment so it's not like it's not question and answers but um okay i'm just saying it, it, yeah we'd love to hear directly from from the community uh, and by the way all of this is being recorded so um if there are any questions or prevalent concern or not questions, I should say, but any prevalent concerns that are brought up, we, we certainly want to follow up on everything that shares in members of the public. So, just for the sake of uh, keeping track of time, I'm just going to set a, a timer on my phone. I'm not. I'll give you like a one minute warning, just so just so you're aware. Okay, great. Thank you so much for joining us. Okay, can you just take your name, please, Michelle Mullen. Thank you. Um, I can proceed. Yes, ma'am. Um, the only question I, well, it's not a question, I guess I could only make a comment. My comment would be, it would be nice to see examples of deferred maintenance. Mm -hmm. um, they've said that several times with several school buildings. Um, I'm not sure I believe them. <laughs> it would just be nice to have examples of what they mean by deferred maintenance um, when some schools are being slated to be fixed and others are not, yeah. um, especially mm -hmm. with the recent facility condition index uh, table where Webster, Avenue School, Pleasant View, and Kennedy have higher um, FCIs than Lauro and Broad Street School, yet they're not being slated for closure. Mm. And that's all I want to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. <laughs> Hi. Hi, how are you? Thanks for joining us. My name is Kate Grail. I'm sorry, um, that again? Caitlin Perea. I'm a parent at ASF. Um, my main thing is they said at least that they had meetings and everything. I have personally gone through every K-12 meeting since 2021 of January and K-12 meetings and there is no minute stating anything about the closure of ASF. Mm -hmm. um, we did not know until it was posted on Twitter as parents. I personally don't even have Twitter. I didn't know until I went to their wrong meeting for a PTO meeting. And it was them because they got 
leaks. And they had to clean up their mess. So we, I didn't know, I wouldn't have known until after Christmas break when they gave us the paperwork to pick a school to have it picked within two and a half weeks. Now, personally, I have two children already in the school, second grade kindergarten. I have another one starting this coming fall, mm -hmm. two of which, the two younger ones have IEPs, and I still haven't gotten an answer about tours for schools. And when I did get in touch with one school, they tried to push me off onto another one because they don't want to get their students too overwhelmed with too many students coming in. Mm. So now I have a school that would be probably fantastic for my children for the IEPs, but they don't want to take more students in because they don't want to disrupt their kids they already have there. Mm. So now we're kind of stuck between a rock and a hard spot yeah. on where we're going with this because now I don't know where any of my kids are going. Deadline's over, so I'm no longer a priority. Her deadline was February 10th. Mm -hmm. For us to pick a school, which we didn't, we had literally two and a half weeks to pick a school. Their meetings that they're talking about that they came to the school in two nights was here's a red folder of all the schools you could have. Mm -hmm. There's maybe five people for tuition here. Sit down, pick your top three. That was the meeting part. That was the whole meeting. That was yeah. the meeting part. I personally am the PTO president, so I literally have access to every meeting held in that school and I'm the first one to know after teachers and like yeah. staff I know before most parents do I didn't know about that meeting it wasn't advertised until the, literally the night of it was like an hour before and it was sending a text message and it was held at dinner time it was five or six o'clock where all of us are feeding our children at that time yeah wow. so there was no transparency the green space we are literally a block away from um Roger Park. Park. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Literally. So we don't, we don't know, um, yeah. So literally the school is we here. You cross the road, go down my home. My that's my street. Yeah. And you walk into Roger Williams Park. Well, how much more green space do you need? Mm -hmm. So then I brought the idea of why don't we have them tear up sense. some of the concrete that we do have as a playground? and oh, have sorry. a community sorry. garden that the PTO could take care of. Mm -hmm. And the kids can learn science with the growing the plants. At the end of the season, we can have a whole potluck PTO event. So on a free would, space. Would, would you mind um, sharing your, your contact with information with us afterward? Because of course. This is, these are yeah. really, really great um, questions that we'd love to get answers. My to. other issue that I had was, and probably I mean your problem, but I'm going to say it. Mm -hmm. um, PPSD failed to give Broad Street School my kid's IEP and they didn't give it to them until there's a safety hazard of my son running out of the school and down Broad Street because they did not know because literally on, the, on his IEP, big letters, he is a runner. They didn't know because they failed to give it to him. When I registered my child, so my second grade is already in school. I get a call. Hi, Ms. Cruz. Well, I know Grayson's all set. If he's registered, he will be starting Young Woods. So the lack of registration isn't because there's not enough students. They're passing them on to the next school. Absolutely. And I couldn't tell you how many times probably happened to. I was lucky enough to already have a kid in the school to know this. Oh my gosh. Thank so you. there was literally no transparency. And Zach. Brian Scott, whatever his name is, and Javier, yes. all have spoke to me individually, and yes. everything they told you tonight about Broad Street was blatant lies. Yes. They haven't produced anyone from special ed to help any of the IEP student parents. I had a person reach out and talk to them myself, and it took three weeks for me to get a hold of anyone. Well, so, yeah, if you could share your contact information. I would love we to. We would love to, to get I have to no doing that. Yeah, answers to your questions. Very right. important. Yeah. Thank you so much for, for sharing uh, that with I'm us. I'm so sorry. Can I just say <laughs> something more on my time? I'm not talking about my husband and Catherine and Carlo. If, if it's okay to have other people speak, and then if you would like okay. to, you know, just, okay. just share it. Okay. I would like to, but I don't know yes. a lot of English. So. That, that's okay. Look, this is this is this is exactly why we're doing this because our jo our job is to hear from members of the community, right? Yeah. Shall I speak or Carlos will hear and speak Spanish? Okay, so I'm gonna say something in Spanish and you can. Try yeah, yo, yo puedo hablar español. Oh, thank you. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I can. Puedes decir nombre, por favor.
Catherine Lopez. Catherine Lopez. Yeah. Okay, I'm just going to set the timer because I do want to make sure that everyone, I know everyone okay. has to get to dinner and all those kinds of things and put the kids to bed. So here we go. So yeah, they don't give us to us a lot of information, like how she said. Um, a lot of Spanish parents, they're scared because they don't know what happened. Nobody asked them, okay? When he was there, he knows the Spanish. Javier Montañez, he knows the Spanish. Yeah, and he not even talk with the people, okay? He talked with Carlos and he said that he's gonna have a meeting with us and he blocked him from his um from his phone, okay? And I have the pictures that the old PTSD, when I concern about them, how they treat us, they block me, all of them. I have the 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 pictures in my phone. All PTSD members block me from emails. So they I can um email them. Because they're not going to receive my emails. They block me. And they said that the school belongs to them. So we don't have no schools. Our, our <coughs> kids do not have any school. Um, I think we need our public school. Because yeah. all, all kids are welcome in there. You know, it, it, um, even if they're black, white, all oh, they are welcome. So I... I I don't know about shadow school because shadow shadow school is like um lottery a lot lottery right mm -hmm. so how are you gonna pick our kids like numbers our kids are, they person okay mm -hmm. yeah. so we have to treat them like person they need to be educators not a uh, a uh, uh, numbers like lottery you are here like if I pick you you're gonna be here you know so I I think we need to be respect. You know, like they not even hear us. They not even talk to us. There's a lot of Spanish parents that have a lot of Spanish parents in my phone that they concerned about, but they are scared. They are scared to talk because a lot of them, they don't know speak English. Mm -hmm. So they are scared. They don't know what to say, what to do. And yes. the 75% of those kids are walkers. So they walk to the school. Absolutely. They not even ask us like how it's gonna affect us. You know, you said they're walkers to the yeah, seventy five percent. Wow, seventy five percent. Yeah, which walkers? I'm trying to think. Okay. Yeah, and that's the only school we have. So they gave a paper to us to choose about twenty schools that we don't know, and we have to choose four school, and they not even quarantine spaces in those schools. So I have two kids in the in, in the orange mm -hmm. I don't know where they're going. I'm not even pick school yet because I don't know if they're gonna be together. So it sounds like um, that's something that probably needs to happen more dialogue about like what schools people could potentially go to and when when, when they have these meetings, you know, sorry to we'll, like kind of make it a, a question answer thing, but. You know if they had translators on site or did no. They no, 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 he he no. he speaks Spanish and he not even speak with the people. No. So he, no. Carlos yeah. has to stand up and yes. talk to people. Don't assign, don't assign, because they're not even quarantine yeah. us spaces in anywhere. So we are people, they have we have a heart, Absolutely. we have feelings. Mm -hmm. So where are our kids going? Yeah. Well, you, thank you, thank you so much for, for sharing that. That 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 would be your time. But I, I would say that let's um. This is also a part of us coming together because when we create this, hopefully this new protocol. Ideally, we're hearing from folks like you about what that looks like because right now it doesn't seem like it's it's working. So I I just want to thank you for for sharing and um. Yeah. Really yeah. appreciate it. It's, We'll take people's emails afterward and think yeah, yeah, yeah. Fun if, yeah. that, if that's possible. Absolutely. Just so we can we can be in touch. Um, thank can, you. can the next person for example, um, thank you so I much for, for sharing? Like my uncle from the school, I now bus I can turn on the bus. Oh, 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 right. The closest school is one point two miles from the bus. Uh, is there anybody else who uh, would like to enter into a public comment? All right. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for joining us. Crystal Strange, L E S T R U G E. I just wanted to make a comment. Um, a couple of years ago, the roof at ASF on Broad Street had, had been replaced. And they're, they're claiming um, that it's still some leaks in it and stuff like that. And, and they spent millions of dollars already on that. 
And I just think maybe you should ask that contractor guy here that, you know, I, I mean, I would, I would call the contractor back. It's under warranty still. Yeah. And, and I would get, I would, I would get that fixed. I mean, it's not something you just say, oh, it leaks, so we're going to move on from it or something like that. But they, they, they spend millions of dollars on the roof already. And um, they're claiming that it's leaking, and I would get the contractor back. And I would ask them why they haven't. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much. much. Yeah, sir, if you could also, I think there's going to be a lot of follow up here, but I mean, these direct questions that we're going to ask them, we want them to, we want you all to be able to see their responses. We ask them, and they won't answer us. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Well, well, that's, you know, <laughs> that's what I'm saying. That's, that's why we're going to. We're going to hold them accountable. We need to figure out the answers to these questions, and we want to make sure that you all get timely responses on all this stuff. Yes, sir. Thank you, Chairman. Um, yes, yeah, so, so I just want to make it clear. Um, obviously, first of all, as elected officials, we want to apologize for, for what you guys are going through. Um, can't even imagine, to be honest. So, so thank you for, for showing up. Uh, to to speak on behalf of your your family. No, I, I think we should give them a community. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not easy to show up, you know. Yeah, but yeah. what I just want to say is, um, I know this council, um, alongside the, the mayor's office, um, is, is definitely um, committed to to play an active role um, in the next couple of years. Um, while unfortunately the, the the school districts aren't in our control right now, we, we definitely want to be part of the conversations going forward. Um, so just want to know that our, for the most part, our council is, is available um, yeah. to, to be a listening ear and do what we can right now in these times. Thank you, Thank you for sharing that. If I could just add to what um, Councilor Sanchez said, the school operations are not under our, our control, but these buildings are still owned by the city. Mm -hmm. And so I think especially this committee um, we we'll want to make sure that we are respecting the people who are in those buildings yes. and like taking care of, of these buildings because the buildings are still ours. And yeah. they, they belong to the city yeah. and you guys are the city. So, and, like, and, and that's exactly why we did this meeting because we want them to be on record about what's going on and what's going to be the process moving forward. Mr. Cedeno, do you, do you want to uh, um, do some public comment? Yeah, you you just have to get uh, a can I just you think it's just like my name is Carlos Sardino. Um I just want to say thank you to all of you. You know, Chelsea, you know very well. Mm -hmm. You know me. You know me very well. Um I don't know how to start because I feel so sad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm painful. Mm. It's great talking about money. We are taxpayers. Yeah. yeah. We all are taxpayers. But we need to be treated like a human being, yeah. not as an animal. Mm. I'm here because I have a community who right. trusts me. Yeah. I don't want to shut my mouth. Mm. Yes, definitely, it's good again talking about money. But what about these people? What about the community? Mm -hmm. What about be transparency? Mm -hmm. What about be um um like you said um not to be um like a like you know bunch of bunch um bunch of uh, uh, lives. Yeah. You know they talking about meetings when they start doing meeting in December when they already made the decision yeah. to close the school. Yeah. But Thank God we have a group of parents, mm -hmm. teachers in the community who's gonna who's we are we are going to continue to fight. Mm -hmm. We're not gonna stop because we need that school open. Mm -hmm. I got my two kids here. Plus Nina. Yeah, I She's my daughter too. We got more than 300 child yes. <laughs> children in that school. They're all my children. They're all my kids. Mm -hmm. So I'm here for them, mm -hmm. yeah. and I'm going to continue to fight for them. Yeah. I don't want. I, I don't need no jobs. I don't need anything. I just need the school keep it open. Keep it open. Mm -hmm. yeah. And thank you because Pedro's been not, not here today. He's supposed to be here today. Yeah. He's the councilman in Washington Park area. Mm -hmm. They don't care. We need people who care about the community. 
You care about the community. You care about the community. You care about the community. You guys care about the, about the community. So we need people like you. Yes. You know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That, that was really heartfelt. Yeah. <laughs> Next uh, public comment, sir. That's awesome. Thank you. So we are, we are blind and brown people. They don't know anything about the South South problems. I grew up in Puerto Rico and South problems. They think we're going to go with each other. I know. Caroline was strange. I don't like to speak in public. Okay. I'm a teacher at Pro yeah, yeah. School for 22 years. Yeah. We're, we're this is my family, yeah. and I've been following this since the closing. There's so much misinformation out there that breaks my heart. I don't know what to do for my families anymore. I'm trying to do the best that I can for these students. So, newer and fewer for Providence. It's not newer and fewer for these students because they don't have any places to go. Providence is promising them schools to go to. You heard Spaziano is full. They are, the spaces are full. Everything you said, the class size is going to get bigger. You know, and there goes any gains we have shown over the last few years. Broad Street School is the third highest in scores. And I just don't understand all this information, like you just heard Mount Pleasant's falling apart. Broad Street School, we spent a lot of money. Yes, it needs more repairs. I have a beautiful classroom, a gorgeous classroom, freshly painted, newly painted. The whole first and second floor is beautiful. Yes, the third floor is leaking, the roof is leaking. Then call the contractor back and have them fix it. We were li literally staged for two years and they were up there working. Where are they? You know, last night we were at the K-12 council meeting and, and Helica said, oh, you got to move on. You can't be throwing old money after old money on a building. You know, we're homeowners. I'd call them back and say, get up there and fix yeah. it. Mm -hmm. not, I'm not going to throw my house away. Absolutely. Yes. I'm not going to throw a school away. Washington Park is a community and I'm going to stand with them. If you want to ask me any questions, please do. It, there's a lot of information when you say, so enrollment's down? Yes, enrollment's down. After COVID, everybody's enrollment dropped. And one of the reasons PPSD enrollment dropped was because if you signed up for virtual schooling, you were not guaranteed your home school when you went to re-enroll again. But who was at registration in the enrollment? There's a mother here, when she went to enroll her child, they didn't give her an option to go into Broad Street. So I'm not really sure how long this has been in place. Maybe they had a different plan. I don't know. So there's a lot of things I don't agree with. There's, no, there's been no community at our school where they've come and spoken to us. I was there for both meetings and it didn't happen. Thank you for sharing. Thank you so Sorry. much for, for sharing. No, I can't do this. We, we cry a lot too. Yeah. 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 Uh, Brad, you, you'd have to. Oh, okay. <laughs> Just a quick comment, and I'm, I'm going to say it too much. Can I have any questions? Yeah, uh, Ricky Sanchez. Um, I just find it completely absurd how the superintendent does not say a single word you know, in any meeting or any space. And, and it's just like, I mean, do we have a superintendent? All, all, the, res all the respect to the superintendent. He's a great person, you know, a lot of respect. He's done a lot for fathers over the years, but not a single word have I ever heard him say anything in public in his community meetings as a parent. So, I want to say Thank you for sharing. Yeah. And the females were disrespected at the meeting. So you forgot that some fact. That his little, what's his tail? Well, that is just, no, um, the 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 Any additional uh, public public comment? Caleb wants to say. Yeah. My daughter wants to say. Caleb. 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 Caleb.
uh, commentary. Oh, and yeah. then we'll Are you sure you want to watch it? Yeah, sure. Sorry. Um, I just want got two other people. Uh, I just wanted to add to the enrollment. Um, mm -hmm. In 2014, when I registered my first one daughter, um, the school district allowed me to choose up to four schools, ranking you know from the least to the greatest, whichever one I wanted. I mean, the greatest to the least. And they allowed, that was in 2014. Mm -hmm. So in 2021, they only allowed me to choose either. Um, and let me go back to the four schools. I don't know if it was within the neighborhood or within the school, the entire district, but either way, I had four choices. In 2021, when I registered my Nina, they only allowed us to choose either Woods, Young Woods, or Broad Street. So they're limiting registration options, so I'm not trusting yeah. the enrollment numbers of Broad Street School if you only allow us to choose those two specific schools. And that was in 2021 when I registered her. So I'm not trusting the enrollment numbers. Um, I will say that as a lifelong Providence resident who graduated from Hope High School, went to Providence schools, I've never seen this level of corruption at Ryden with the Providence School Department. And I served as a long term slave in the pool. I used to work for Providence as a substitute teacher. So I've just never seen this level of disrespect to our teachers, parents. Um, I don't know what was the last thing I want to say. Um, I think the big elephant in the room, too. I don't like to speculate, but it's not like Mayor Smiley and former Mayor Iborza and former Mayor Angel Tavares didn't say that they didn't want an all public charter school. So I think that's the agenda. I think that's the push. I think Broad Street School is a beautiful building. I had somebody at my church say to me, Oh, Michelle, I saw you on the news, but so did they close? Um, are they really going to close that beautiful building? It's a beautiful building. Um, so it's perfect for a charter school. And I think that's the, the push. I don't want to speculate. It's not like the mayor's made it a secret at that press conference a couple months ago. I don't remember when it was. <laughs> but um, yeah, so that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Jeremy Spencer, S-E-N-C-E-R. Um, I wanted to call here, I mean, there's nothing that, that any of us can say to capture really what this community's been saying for the past few months, but there was something noteworthy. Um, as a member, I was on the Hopkins team, as an actual member of my, my name, sign in the back, was the only teacher member that was allowed to participate. And so I remember the discussions we had about removing layers of bureaucracy. This was a big thing. It was about efficiency, and it was about making sure that decisions could be made you know, more efficiently without these layers. But tonight, um, this committee stated something that's been repeated in many other forums, and it was, we don't have any actual oversight authority over this. We've heard that from the Senate. We've heard that from the House. We've heard it at school board. We've now heard it here. We've heard it from counselors previously. We hear it even from the mayor. And the simple question that they would have is who does have oversight authority? Because in this case, we, we also heard about, you know, several different sort of committee meetings where people can have input, yet as the families brought up, they've been unable to produce, meaning PPSD, any minutes where school closures were discussed. We've been asking tomorrow be day 75 to produce minutes from the buildings committee meeting to show this is where we discussed school closures, any place. So essentially what we've heard in several different forums is that a decision was made for the people in the community mm -hmm. by somebody who's not from the community. And that's been a consistent theme in under this takeover. And you know, one final thought was we actually had an opportunity to hear from Dr. Domingo Morel um, in 2019, who cautioned everybody involved with this takeover that there is a risk when you have a state takeover of marginalizing the community that you're supposed to uplift and serve. And I can't think of a more clear example of a community being marginalized. I mean. We've heard what, what people said. They, children and, and families are out sometimes two, three nights a week, and there hasn't even been the common courtesy 
by the commissioner or by any of the PPSD leaders to meet with them, to speak with them, other than to get them to sign a form yeah. so that they can say we have 99% yeah. rate of you know form completion. They've asked, and the people were here tonight, they got up and left. Last night at K-12 meeting, the commissioner got up and left. So when they requested they come to the school, they didn't come to the school. So not only were they neglected prior to the decision being made, they've been neglected after the decision has been made. So I just, you know, I wanted to capture that for this body, knowing that, you know, we keep hearing potentially two years before we bring back to local control. Two years seems like a long time. I know there's a date of September 1st, 2024, and I would just urge anybody involved with, with the council to work towards a transition to begin mm -hmm. to bring back into local control so that this doesn't happen to another community. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. And thank you. Uh, I think before we close out, I, you know, one of the things that I would like to share, and I know we're all committed to this, is working together so we are getting consistent updates. We do have, you know, public properties within our purview. So we intend to um, ensure that there's accountability and oversight on public properties and, and to work uh, with everyone in the community to do that. So um, without further ado, is there a... Wait, before we motion? Yeah. I don't see any hands raised on Zoom, but we should probably make sure no one on Zoom wants to make a public comment. Or I don't know if that's from the um, They're no, not allowed to. Not allowed yeah, just, okay, just wanted to do the check. open meetings. Yes. Correct. Um, all right, so is there a motion to, to adjourn? Motion. So second. Motion made by Councillor Peterson, seconded by Councillor Andrew Spahn. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Yes, I had it. We need to adjourn.